All right, so I think we'll get underway. Welcome everyone to this year's AML 101 training. I'm delighted to be joined here today by Amber D. Scott and David Vigen of Outlier Compliance Group. Many, if not all, CJ members are dealers in precious metals and stones and have reporting obligations when it comes to anti-money laundering. And one of those obligations is to provide annual training for staff. Today's training will focus on AML basics, which can be used in addition to your own specific procedures to fulfill your training obligations that are outlined in the AML legislation and related guidance. Amber and David are both anti-money laundering compliance experts and former bankers. Their company, Outlier Compliance Group, has been working with the CJA for almost a decade, developing compliance resources, providing consulting services, and sharing their expertise with members through sessions like this one. And before I hand it over to David and Amber, I encourage you to put any questions you have in the chat and we'll address them at the end of the presentation during the question period. So Amber and David, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you Thank very you. much, Alana. And we're going to jump to the next slide. Um, so Alana's already given a great introduction for us. Thank you very much. Uh, David and myself uh, participate very actively in designing the compliance kit that's available to you through the Canadian Jewelers Association. And if you're here today because you're wondering, oh geez, what is anti-money laundering and what do I have to do? Hopefully you'll leave with a really good sense of that by the end of this presentation. And also know that there are a number of other tools that are available to you as members of CJA um, for no additional cost, as well as at uh, cost for anyone who's joining us today who is not a member of CJA. Next slide. We are compliance geeks, so I'll start with a few hefty disclaimers. We're not lawyers and nothing that we should say should be interpreted as legal advice. We don't represent any government or government agency, which is to say that we're going to talk a lot about the Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Centre of Canada, or FinTrack, which is our anti-money laundering regulator but we do not represent their official position. So if they say something that is different than what we are saying, I would recommend listening to them. If you have questions about a particular situation, company, especially because we're going to talk about things like suspicious transaction reports, try to phrase that in a, in a pseudonymous type of way or a non-identifying type of way. And if you're not able to do that, feel free to reach out to us after the presentation rather than asking that in a public forum. We will not be recording the Q&A session for exactly that reason, just as a precaution. Um, but nonetheless, we would still consider this to be a semi-public forum in terms of the types of questions that you ask. And finally, information should be free. And so if you want to use this presentation, as Alana had already mentioned, as part of your internal training, you are free to do that. Next. And I'll hand it over to you for this section, David. Sure, so we'll start with some basics. Um, so what is money laundering? Essentially, money laundering is the process of taking money that is obtained by criminal activity and disguising the source to make it look legitimate. Uh, in Canada, under the criminal code, it is illegal to launder money, but also knowingly assist in that process. Uh, under the Proceeds of Crime Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Act associated regulations, uh, companies must take steps to make sure their business is not used to launder money. Um, so if you do suspect such things are happening, there are reporting obligations around that. So let's talk a little bit about money laundering as a process. Uh, so money laundering is generally described as having three stages. Um, the three stages are placement, layering, and integration. Essentially, in the placement stage, it's taking that cash or illicit funds um, that's come for criminal activity and entering it into the financial system. Uh, an example that could be, uh, you know, specific to the DPMS sector is the purchase of a gold bar or gold coins or something like that. In the layering stage, it's basically moving the funds between accounts in order to make the trail look a little bit difficult and hard to follow. Uh, example in that situation where a gold bar is bought or a gold coin, um, it's perhaps transferring it to a nominee to separate the ownership from the, from the actual criminal. Uh, eventually that gold bar um, is sold 
and then essentially that nominee would be paid for selling that um, gold bore or coin. Um, and in the last stage, which is integration, is taking that money um, so that nominee got paid, is taking that and moving it into some sort of an investment or real estate. They could be purchasing boats and essentially that is the, the process of money laundering there. So we'll talk about terrorist financing next. Terrorist financing essentially is any act or mission that helps fund terrorism. So what is terrorism? Terrorism is really an act to intimidate the government or public at large, usually through some sort of violent uh, or scare tactics. So what's the difference? Essentially money laundering, the process, the, the proceeds always come from criminal activity. In terrorist financing, they can come from criminal activity, but they can also come from legitimate sources. Examples are charities are set up and you know uh, we donate to charities. Charity could be co-opted into sharing um, that funds for terrorist activity. Um, in money laundering, the stages are always placement layering integration. And what the outcome there is, is to make the funds look legitimate. Whereas in terrorist financing, the ultimate act would be terrorism is the outcome. So what is a DPMS? Uh, if you are a dealer in precious metals and stones, um, because you buy or sell precious metals uh, or jewelry to the public, you are considered a DPMS and you must comply with various laws, which we're going to talk to a little bit later. Specifically, from a definition standpoint, um, a dealer of precious metals and stones is any company that buys or sells precious metals um, once you purchase uh, $10,000 or more in a single transaction. Um, precious metals are defined as gold, silver, uh, platinum, whereas precious stones are diamonds, sapphires, emeralds. These include lab-grown um, uh, stones, so that's important to note. Uh, and then jewelry is anything that is made for adornment or personal, um, personal use. So what is FinTrac? Uh, as Amber mentioned earlier, FinTrac is the main regulator for regulated entities. Essentially, they are the watchdog and they have a mandate to make sure uh, money laundering and terrorist financing is not happening in Canada. Uh, we have to submit certain types of reports to FinTrac um, and there are other obligations. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, FinTrac also has the right to come and do a review or an audit on you. Uh, so that is something you should be aware of. There is correspondence from FinTrack that you will receive time to time, which includes things such as that examination. So it's important to always pass that to your compliance officer because these requests are usually time sensitive. So what happens if you don't comply? Um, FinTrack can actually administer penalties uh, there are administrative monetary penalties, which we'll talk about in a second, and there are criminal uh, penalties. While the criminal penalties don't happen as frequently as the administrative monetary penalties, they are there, they are applicable to the entity, or they are also applicable to the employees as well. The directors and staff can be held liable. Um, and you can see kind of on the slide there, some of them are, well, all of them are pretty high. So a failure to report a suspicious transaction from a criminal standpoint could be up to $2 million or five years imprisonment. Um, there's obligations related to record keeping and other large cash and large virtual currency reporting. Outside of the criminal uh, aspect, they can, a FinTrack can administer monetary penalties. Um, there was a little bit of a pause and, and that had to do with kind of a, a court situation. Um, but as of 2019, mid, around this time, actually in 2019, uh, FinTrack released new guidance and there's calculations on how administrative monetaries can, um, how they work. Um, we won't get into too much of that. You, the link um, will be provided in the slide if you did want to kind of look into that a little bit more. But essentially, the violations are categorized. So there's minor violations, serious violations, and various serious violations. And what is important to note is the range. So while there is a dollar 
Usually that is not used in the calculation, but it can be in a range of for a minor from a dollar to a thousand serious from one to a hundred thousand and then very serious. Um, there is for the individual and the entity up to 500,000. To give you an example, uh, not filing an STR is something which would be categorized as a very serious violation and it's per violation. So if you do that math, you know, you could be looking at, you know, for missing 10 uh, STRs, it could be a million dollar fine. So, uh, and again, there, there's other calculations um, behind the scene, but that's kind of the gist of it. And actually one, one important thing to note when I say there's other things kind of behind the calculation, they, they really focus on the harm done by the violation and that's how it's categorized. So essentially going back to that STR uh, example, the harm done is they don't have intelligence related to money laundering and terrorist financing. So therefore that um, is seen as something very serious. Uh, there was a recent penalty, um, one that happened kind of mid last year, uh, Monte Cristo Jewelers um, in Vancouver was fined uh, $222,000 uh, for committing four violations. Um, and the violations stem back from their review that happened in 2019. Um, we've seen that happening quite a bit where FinTrack is actually um, taking some time to come out with the administrative monetary penalties. So examinations can happen, but it can, might be a little while, a year or two, where before you actually see um, those violations. Uh, the violations specific here, the four that, uh, that resulted in the fine were related to, first was related to uh, suspicious transactions. They don't detail how many transactions or the extent of it, but that could have been, there was one, or there could have been multiple. My guess is there would have been multiple based off of the wording. Um, the second one is failure to develop and apply written call, uh, policies and procedures. So to what extent they had policies and procedures is not clear, but essentially it does look like pieces um, of it was missing and not only having it in place, but applying it as well. Failure to assess and document a risk assessment. So as part of your obligations, you do need to have a risk assessment in place that outlines all your uh, possible ways that your business can be used to launder money, but then all the controls that you have in place to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, this DPMS did not seem to have a risk assessment in place. And lastly, was failure to develop and maintain a written ongoing compliance training plan. So kind of what we're doing here today. Uh, there is an annual requirement for training, um, but as well, you do need to keep a forward-looking plan um, and keep records related to it. So just being here today is great, but there is a little bit more that has to be done. And we're going to talk about the actual obligations that apply to the DPMS sector next. I will actually turn it over to Amber, and she'll walk through some of that. Um, so we have a few different pieces of enabling legislation, the Proceeds of Crime, Money Laundering, Terrorist Financing Act, oof, PCMLTFA for short, um, and its enacted regulations that accompany it. We have the Criminal Code of Canada, which defines the crime of money laundering. We have something known as ministerial directives, um, which means that the Minister of Finance in Canada can come out with edicts uh, now and again, and currently we have two of them. Let's say that we as reporting entities or just we as the population of Canada in general have to do certain things. And in these cases, these things relate to Iran and North Korea. And we also have sanctions, um, which are can be both economic sanctions um, or they can be sanctions related to specific types of goods or services that we're not able to provide either to certain individuals or to certain regions of the world. Next slide. In terms of your responsibilities under the law as a dealer in precious metals and stones, you need to appoint a compliance officer. This is someone who is ultimately responsible for your compliance program. They have to understand Canadian compliance. They have to be sufficiently senior within your organization. So you can't take that newest customer service person that only works weekends and say, congratulations, I'm sorry, you're the compliance officer. They just don't have the authority to do what you need them to do in that case. 
Um, they don't have to have any specific designation, but they do need to understand Canadian compliance. They have to have the right authority to oversee that program, and they have to have the right resources within your organization, um, which might mean additional staff if you're a big organization. It might mean IT systems. All of those things need to come together for an effective compliance program. You need to have policies and procedures, and policy is a high-level thing that talks about here's what we are required to do under the law where procedures are very specific to your business and they talk about how you accomplish those things. You need to have a risk assessment, and this is kind of an esoteric document, but it talks about the risk that your business could be used to either launder money and finance terrorism, and then the things that you have in place to prevent those from happening. And again, this is very specific to your business. You need to have an AML compliance effectiveness review. This is like an audit, but for compliance, it's exactly as much fun as it sounds. And you need to do this at least every two years that you're in business. And you need to have training, as David mentioned, um, not just training, but also a training plan that is forward looking. In terms of your operations, you need to submit certain types of reports to FinTrack. You need to keep records and the records are required whether or not there is any reporting. You need to identify customers that do transactions that meet certain conditions, and we'll talk about exactly what those are. Um, you need to assess the risk of certain customers when you form what's known as a business relationship with them. And you need to conduct transaction monitoring when there's a business relationship with your customers. Next slide. In terms of keeping your compliance program up to date, um, you need to make sure that your documentation is the latest so that it reflects both any changes to the law, that it reflects your current processes. And even if you don't think anything has changed, it's still a good practice to make sure that you're going through and updating that documentation at least once a year. If you're using the compliance kit tools uh, through CJA, through Outlier's website, you're able to go on and do that through, a, through the setup wizard. Um, and you would just go through that document and look at that, read the questions, see if anything has changed, uh, see if there are any new questions. And we do add new material whenever we have changes to the legislation. Next slide. In terms of record keeping and reporting, um, any time that you have to keep a record. So when we talk about things that you do for anti-money laundering, it's not enough to just do the thing. It's not enough to just collect your customer's identification when you're required to do that. You have to be able to prove that you've done the thing. And if you have to be able to prove that you've done the thing, you have to keep that proof, that record for five years. If you aren't sure, if you're watching this video and you think, oh, we were about to throw out some records, but I'm not sure if we really need these from an anti-money laundering perspective or not, stop what you're doing ask your compliance officer before you go through with the destruction of those records. There are also certain transactions that you have to report to FinTrack and in some cases to other agencies, including the RCMP and CSIS. Next slide. The transactions that you have to submit to FinTrack, the transaction reporting as a dealer in precious metals and stones are relatively limited. In any case where you have to submit one of these types of transaction reports, you also need to identify your customer. Next slide. So the first type of transaction that you have to report is a large cash transaction. This is when you have received, um, not when you're, when you're paying out, but when you receive $10,000 or more in cash, either by or on behalf of the same person or entity in the same 24 hour period. A large virtual currency transaction is quite similar, except in this case, instead of physical cash, so it's not notes or coins, but we're talking about virtual currencies um, like Bitcoin or Monero. In terms of suspicious transaction reports, um, this means that you have a case where there are reasonable grounds to suspect that a transaction might be related to money laundering or terrorist financing. This doesn't mean that we have to know um, it's not reasonable grounds to believe, but it's reasonable grounds to suspect, which is a much lower standard. There just has to be enough there, more than just my spidey senses are tingling, but there are some facts and contexts and indicators that make me think that this might be related to some type of nefarious activity. I don't need to know what the underlying activity is in order for this to be reportable. 
There are also attempted suspicious transactions. And this might be a case where someone approaches us and asks us to do a transaction that we're not comfortable with. And we might reject that transaction, but it still hit that reasonable grounds to suspect threshold. And so we need to report it to FinTrack. And finally, we have terrorist property reporting. And in this case, we're in possession of property and property can be jewelry, property can be precious metals, property can be funds that is identified as belonging to a terrorist or terrorist group. And that's the case where we have to do some additional reports. Um, these tend to be fairly serious reports, they, um, similar to reports that would be related to threats to national security. And so we want to make sure that we're taking care of those immediately, um, right away. As soon as we're able to file those reports, we need to file those reports. Next slide. So for those large cash transaction reports, we really are just talking about cash, um, notes, coins, physical cash. In this case, it's absolutely okay to tell the customer that you need to file a large cash transaction report. You'll be asking them some additional questions as part of this process, including um, what's, the, what's the source of that cash? What's the purpose of this transaction? So you're getting some additional information as part of your conversation with them, as well as collecting and recording their ID information. Next slide. Large virtual currency transactions, as I said, very similar, except that instead of talking about cash, we're talking about virtual currency. Um, and virtual currency is different from fiat currency, which, which just means money. Um, so when someone sends you an e-transfer or a wire, that's not a virtual currency transaction. Um, virtual currency are, are things like Bitcoin. Uh, they are different and it's things that exist outside of the banking sector. And so in this case, much like cash, it's not coming through that bank intermediary. And so we're looking for additional information about that transaction. Here again, it's absolutely okay to let your customer know that you need to collect additional information about this type of transaction. At this point, these rules have been in place for a while, and I think that for the most part, customers will expect this to be the case. And so they'll be used to providing this type of information as part of either a large cash transaction or a large virtual currency transaction. Next slide. The 24 hour rule, when I talk about what does it mean if you're doing a transaction by or on behalf of the same person that adds up to $10,000 or more in the same 24 hour period, um, we're expected to keep track of that. And so if I come to Alana and I buy a ring um, in the morning and that ring costs $6,000 and I pay her for that in cash, and then I come back in the afternoon and say, you know what, I'd really like the matching earrings and uh, the necklace as well. And so now I'm going to pay um, an, you know, another amount that's several thousand dollars in cash for that. And so we've exceeded that $10,000 cash transaction. Uh, they're two separate transactions. They would both be entered into one report. And within the context of that report, you can add transactions to it. Next slide. When you report one of these types of transactions, one of the things that you do is you ask if there are third parties. And so this is just a piece of information that you collect. In the case that I just talked about where Alana was selling me jewelry, she would ask me, yeah, Amber, is this transaction something that you're doing for you or, or are you doing it on someone else's behalf? Now, on someone else's behalf doesn't mean that I really like David and I'm actually buying these things as a present for David. It would mean that I'm receiving instructions from someone um, and, and not just David telling me, oh yeah, I really like those particular earrings. Um, but someone's directing that transaction. Essentially, it's someone that doesn't want to be a party to the transaction, but they're behind the scenes directing what's happening. And so that's, that's really what you're looking for in terms of this third party. You might see this in certain contexts where there's someone that's coming in and, and doing a transaction, and I'm particularly leery about this around transactions with bars, ingots, so, so you're um, more... Uh, precious metals that aren't in finished jewelry yet. Um, you might see these types of transactions around stones where it seems like someone's receiving direction from someone who isn't a party to that transaction. 
And then you would have some questions about what's happening there. If you are watching this as an employee of a dealer in precious metals and stones, and you think that you have one of these situations where maybe there's a third party, but and you ask the person and they say, oh, no, no, it's, it's on my own. It's on my own behalf. I'm not taking directions from, from anyone. And then immediately they're turning around to, an, to another person or they're, you know, they're you know, clearly getting direction on their cell phone from someone else. That's something you want to talk with your compliance officer about in terms of transactions that might be a suspicious transaction because there's an undeclared third party. Next slide. In terms of unusual transactions, these are just things that are outside of the norm that we want to escalate to our compliance officers so that they can make the decision about whether or not this is something that's truly suspicious and needs to be reported or not. There's no minimum dollar threshold. Uh, the transaction might involve cash, but it might not involve cash at all. Uh, if the transaction is completed, um, you report it. And even if it's not completed, when you have those attempted suspicious transactions where someone is asking you to do something, you would still escalate that to your compliance officer. And in these cases, although we do try to collect identification from the customer if we're able to do so, we can't tell the customer that we're reporting a suspicious transaction. That's something that's known as tipping off. So in this case, you would never say to a customer, your behavior is suspicious, give me your ID, um, but, but you would try to obtain that ID as part of your normal sales process. And it can be tricky, we respect that. There might be some situations where you feel like if you tried to collect the ID, for instance, if someone asks you to do a transaction and you say, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. Um, if you were to then ask them for their ID, that might be problematic. Um, if there's someone that happens to be um, dressed as a, it, as in a way that shows that they're a gang member or that they're involved in some type of violent affiliation, you would never do that and put, and put yourself in harm's way, for instance. So if there's ever a situation where you have fear that if you request any type of identification that this is going to be problematic, um, please don't do that. Document why you made the decision. Um, document the reasons that you didn't collect the ID, either that you, um, you know, that there was a safety concern, that you were afraid that this would tip the person off, that you were filing a suspicious transaction report, and carry on. Next slide. In terms of the stages of suspicion, uh, we go from a simple hunch, so this is that idea that my spidey senses are tingling, something about this is not quite right. I don't know that I can necessarily articulate what it is, uh, but, but something about it doesn't seem quite right. These I might talk to the compliance officer about, but it's probably not going to lead to a report to FinTrack. Uh, we move into reasonable grounds to suspect when we have an assessment of the facts and context and indicators. And this tells us that there's a possibility that money laundering or terrorist financing might be occurring. I don't have to know that there's a crime that has occurred, but there's enough there to tell me that it's possible that that's the case and at that point, we want to refer it to FinTrack. Um, we should be able to articulate the reasons that we think that it's possible that that's the case. So what, what were the facts in that situation? What was the context? Um, and context can be things like, if you know uh, that um, in terms of my job, I'm a cashier at Tim Hortons, but I'm coming in and I'm buying $50,000 in gold bars every week for cash, and that there seems to be someone that is accompanying me, but they're waiting outside the door. Um, so I'm coming in by myself and I'm making these purchases and I'm presenting my ID and then it just seems like I'm doing a handoff to someone else. That, that's the type of context that you would include in these suspicious transaction reports. Um, and indicators, and the indicator in that scenario would be that there's someone who's coming with me, who's potentially watching me, who's potentially directing that transaction. So that's certainly enough to hit reasonable grounds to suspect that there might be money laundering or terrorist financing. And then we get into reasonable grounds to believe. And if you hit reasonable grounds to believe, you have long since passed the point uh, where you've hit reasonable grounds to suspect. And here you're looking at a probability that money laundering or terrorist financing is actually occurring. Uh, you're able to present a set of verified facts. So things that can prove that suspicion um, and prove support of that suspicion. So if you've gotten to that point, um, you, you can stop investigating, you know that you have to report at that point. 
um, and work on starting to get that report ready and have that as something that you can submit to FinTrack as soon as practicable. Next slide. In terms of indicators in customer behavior, um, you can look online, you can see all different types of things that say, oh, if someone's lying, they're looking up and to the right. There is no singular one indicator in behavior that someone is being suspicious. There, there is nothing that works every time. It's really going to depend on you, on your business, on your customer base. Um, you'll have a sense of what's normal. And if something seems off to you, lean into that and, and think about what that could mean. Have a discussion with your compliance officer about it and potentially ask some additional questions in that scenario. There are, of course, a long list of potential indicators that FinTrack has published, but it's really important for you to understand what's normal in the context of your own business. Next slide. These can be things like um, in that scenario that I discussed where I said, if you know, given the circumstances, so my circumstances in that example were that I was a cashier at Tim Hortons, it would be very unusual for me to be making $50,000 gold bar purchases on a regular basis. Um, if the transaction just doesn't make sense. So if I'm coming into you um, and I'm, I'm buying items and I'm selling items and it just seems like there's this really rapid churn in a way that would lose me money that just isn't rational, it's not a thing a normal rational person is going to do, then that should raise questions. Um, if I'm making a lot of purchases in cash in amounts that are just under the reporting threshold, so just under that $10,000 limit. And this is something that's known as structuring. So essentially breaking up those transactions into smaller transactions to make it less reportable. Um, and in my example where I'm buying jewelry from Elena, maybe I say to her, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy these today for $6,000, but can you please hold on to these for me? I don't want you to have to do a report um, so I'm going to I'm going to put them on layaway and I'm going to come back in and give you six thousand dollars in two days. And then uh, in two more days after that, I'll give you another six thousand dollars until it's paid off. But we'll never hit that ten thousand dollar limit. Less paperwork for you, less getting ID for me. Uh, that's definitely something that we would consider to be suspicious because that transaction has now been structured. Next slide. When a customer changes their transaction, so here again in that same scenario, if I said, ooh, okay, so um, what about if I give you $9,900 in cash and then I'm gonna put the rest of my credit card, then we don't have to file a report. Again, you're getting into that territory where someone has structured their transaction. If someone is refusing to be ID'd in a scenario where ID is part of the normal course of business, that should raise questions for you. Um, if you believe that a customer might have provided false or misleading information, and we see this sometimes in cases of identity fraud, where there might be someone that presents different IDs at different times, that should always raise questions. Um, if a customer is making payments uh, using payment methods that are just unusual or don't make sense, those are the types of things that should bubble up. Um, and the last one is going to seem a little bit absurd. But when a customer tells you that they're buying something with proceeds of crime, that automatically triggers a suspicious transaction report. And I know that seems absolutely silly. I will tell you that I have seen across all reporting entity sectors, different types of suspicious transaction reports where someone has bragged either to a customer service person or to a teller at a bank to say, yep, you know, I'm, I'm doing this transaction because the cocaine business is going really well for me and, and I've got all this money to splash around hey, maybe have dinner with me later, you're, you're cute. Um, ludicrous, these are the types of things that people do. And if that happens, that triggers a suspicious transaction report immediately. Next slide. In terms of terrorist property, this is really about property that's in your possession. And here again, property, it can be metals, it can be stones, it can be finished jewelry, it can be um, money, it can be um, funds that you've received into your bank account. So anything that you think that you have um, that might belong to a terrorist or terrorist group, that's something that needs to be reported right away. And if you have to file one of these terrorist property reports, you should also file a suspicious transaction report with FinTrack. Next slide. <clears throat> 
In terms of sending reports to the compliance officer, if you're not the compliance officer within your organization and you have to escalate something to your compliance officer, um, I say this as a former compliance officer, please do that as soon as you can. As you saw earlier, all of these reports have very specific timelines and there are potential penalties for missing those timelines. So we want to make sure that the compliance officer is able to pull everything together, get all that information and report it to FinTrack within the appropriate timeline. Um, if you're not sure what information is needed, uh, please discuss that with your compliance officer. And again, sooner rather than later. Next slide. And remember, you are protected under the law when you make these reports. This is really important. Um, again, there's nothing that you should be asked to do that would jeopardize your own safety. So when you talk about potentially filing that report where you know that someone, in, in, in some cases, you might actually know that they're affiliated with organized crime or that they might be a dangerous individual, um, these suspicious transaction reports don't get submitted to court. The person doesn't find out that you've filed them, and they are not permitted to sue you when you filed a report in good faith. And what in good faith means is that I'm filing the suspicious transaction report because I have hit reasonable grounds to suspect. I am not filing the suspicious transaction report because this person is my ex and I think they're nasty and I hope something bad happens to them. Next slide. I'll hand it over to you there, David. Great, so we're gonna talk about identification uh, in this next section. Uh, so identifying customers, and, and when we're speaking about identifying customers, we're talking about how it is defined under the AML obligations as a DPMS you must follow. You may have other um, triggers internally um, based off of processes, but we're strictly speaking from an AML obligation standpoint. Uh, so you do have to identify customers in certain situations. Uh, large cash transactions, as Amber mentioned, that $10,000 threshold, large virtual currency transactions, again, the same threshold there, and then suspicious and attempted suspicious uh, transactions are the others where you have to identify customers. So how do you identify a customer? Um, the method that's probably going to be most used if, as, as DPMS is going to be using uh, government issued photo identification. Um, you can use any document, driver's license is probably most common, but you could use a passport or something like that, so long as it is, it is government issued. Um, and it has to be issued by a federal uh, or provincial government in Canada or equivalent in a foreign government. The document has to be authentic. It has to be valid, uh, so not expired. Uh, somebody comes in with an old driver's license, unfortunately, you can't choose that. They will need to provide something else. Um, it includes a unique reference number and obviously should include the name of the person that's being identified and the photo of the person. And essentially when you're identifying a person face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, they're in, their, in your store, you're confirming, yes, that photo looks like the person standing in front of me. Yes, it is the name that they gave me. Um, it does match. We get questions about health cards. So can health cards be used as identification? So if somebody hands me a uh, provincial health card, can I take that? And for the most part, the answer is no, um, with the exception of if you operate in Quebec, you can, but in all honesty, it's just easier if you accept the typical driver's license or passport. Um, and, and the reason being is there is um, there, there's information that is captured on related to the barcode at the back that relates to your health records, and that's why that's not usually used. So if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I, I lost my wallet, I, I lost, you know, I don't have anything else. How can how can I purchase, you know, this this Rolex? I want to pay ten thousand cash and then, you know, other amounts on a credit card. Um, you can use the dual process method for identifying this person. Um, and what that is is using two different reliable sources to confirm two of the three listed on the screen. Uh, so their name and address, name and date of birth or an account with a financial institution. So you could accept something like a bank statement uh, and then a utility bill, so long as the information did align. Um, the dual process infers, uh, like I said, referring to independent sources. So if I am providing a uh, bank statement um, and then um, a mortgage paper or something like that, and then they're both from Bank of Montreal, that wouldn't be acceptable. Uh, last bullet there, information must be valid and current. Uh, 
So those are methods used to identify individuals. Um, you may also have customers that are organizations and there's certain information that you will need to collect for that organization, which essentially is the proof that the organization exists. Um, and that can kind of come in multiple forms. But then you also need to collect information about the people who own or control the business. Um, and that's 25% or more known as the beneficial owners. And this can be direct or indirect. So sometimes you do need to probably uh, drill down on structures to, to get to that actual ultimate beneficial owners. Um, if you also need to confirm if the organization is a not-for-profit and they solicit funds from public. So you do need to ask those questions and not only ask those questions, but keep a record of those questions being asked. So what happens if identification fails? Um, you are not to conduct large cash transactions or large virtual currency transactions. You have to reject the transaction uh, if the identification fails. Uh, in the case of an entity, if the beneficial ownership cannot be confirmed, uh, the senior most executive, uh, the CEO, for instance, uh, needs to be identified, but then you need to consider the organization as high risk. And we'll talk about uh, a little bit about what that means. Business relationships. This is a, sometimes a confusing terminology, uh, not only for DPMS, but most regulated entities. Essentially, a business relationship is any customer that you have business with uh, that has conducted two or more activities that require identification within a five-year period. And this is either an individual or an entity. Um, what you need to do is collect, why are they doing business with you. And, and it could be very straightforward. You know, it, it could be I'm purchasing, selling jewelry. That's as simple as it needs to be. And it just needs to be recorded. But again, that's at that threshold of two or more activities that require identification within a five year period. If you have a business relationship, do you need to consider publicly exposed foreign persons? Uh, and head of international organizations, there has to be a determination. And this determination can be done multiple ways. You can ask the customer directly, which is what a lot of uh, DPMSs will probably do. Um, there are also softwares that can do this in the background for you. Uh, and essentially, if you, they are a, a PEP, as we refer to, um, there is certain information that has to be collected. Um, if they are domestic, they do not need to be considered high risk. You do need to do a evaluation to determine if you would consider them high risk or not. Um, but if they are a foreign PEP, uh, they have to be considered high risk. And here's just an, uh, some examples of who would be a foreign PEP. Um, so for instance, a head of a state or a head of a government in another country, they would be considered uh, there. Uh, let's go over to kind of what the domestic is. Uh, so somebody as governor general, that person would be considered uh, a domestic pet. Head of an international organization, uh, head of an international organization established by governments or the head of an institution established by an international organization. And I am going to hand it back over to Amber to talk about some additional considerations and changes that are happening that will potentially impact the DPMS sector. Perfect. Thanks, David. Uh, next slide. So we have a, a change in Canada, which is coming. If you're registered in Quebec, you have seen it already. If you're registered federally, we should expect to see it later this year which is a beneficial ownership registry. And currently you can see a search tool in beta that lets you search registered companies across Canada. Um, coming later this year, you will be asked when you update your registration to include the owners, so anyone that owns or controls the company. Um, you will be asked for an address and that includes a home address, but you also have the opportunity to put in an address for service. Um, or, or a, an additional address. And I highly recommend, particularly for folks in this industry, um, because there are security considerations, that you do this. Um, this allows another address, such as your business address, to be presented publicly while your home address remains hidden. 
This is very similar to what we have in the director registrations in the federal business registration currently. As dealers in precious metals and stones, um, as all reporting entities, there will be obligations to report any discrepancies that we notice. And this doesn't just mean like, oh, I, you know, it looks like someone's, um, you know, it's off by, by one, so they might have mistyped their um, unit number or something like that. But really, is there something that looks like the information in that registration is different than what the person told you is true about the company? So is there some type of attempt to obfuscate or some type of attempt to misrepresent? Next slide. From a, uh, again, from a federal anti-money laundering perspective, we're currently going through what's known as a parliamentary review. It's something that happens every five years where we look at all of the anti-money laundering legislation in Canada and say, does this make sense? Is there anything that should change? And so CJA is very actively participating in those conversations right now. We're also expecting that we'll have another mutual evaluation from the Financial Action Task Force, which is an international watchdog uh, that will essentially assess how well Canada is doing as a country in terms of our anti-money laundering regime. Both of these exercises tend to lead to changes to Canada's anti-money laundering regime. And so stay tuned for what exactly those will be. Um, we don't know at this point in time, but you can expect that over the next year or two, we're going to see some additional changes to our regime. Remember to keep those anti-money laundering programs up to date. Again, um, once there, we know what the changes are, we'll make sure that those get populated into the compliance kits for you, but please keep up on them. You have to go in, you have to go through the setup wizard and, and do those updates and make sure that your documents are up to date. Next slide. Um, this is the contact for David and myself. This brings us to the end of the formal presentation. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today. And I'll ask that at this point, we stop recording so that we can jump right in and address questions.